Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Any guests to the River's Edge today? It's wonderful to have you with us. Psalm 94 calls us to worship the living God this morning. If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. When I thought, my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. Can wicked rulers be allied with you, those who frame injustice by statute? They band together against the life of the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. He will bring back on them their iniquity and wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord our God will wipe them out. With these truths in mind, let us go to the Lord with a moment of silence anticipation and reverence. Lord, we come to you on this first day of the week to be reminded that you are our strength, you are our help, you are our shield, our rock of refuge. Lord, you have destroyed your enemies, and we were your enemies. But Lord, you made a way for us through the cross. You destroyed sin and death for all who trust in Jesus, so we can be made friends with you, Lord. And so we praise you that you have done this. We rejoice at your justice and your grace. Help us to worship you now in spirit and truth, for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ alone. She is his new creation by spirit.
continue through the Heidelberg Catechism this morning as we learn these truths of Scripture through the oral teaching. So I will read the question and have you respond with me on the answer. Question 20. Are all people saved through Christ just as they were lost through Adam? No. Only those are saved who through true faith are grafted into Christ and accept all his benefits. Question 21. What is true faith? True faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as true all that God has revealed to us in Scripture, it is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit creates in me by the Gospel that God has freely granted, not only to others, but to me also, forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These are gifts of sheer grace, granted solely by Christ's merits. Amen. I would ask the ushers forward at this time. We will prepare to worship the Lord through our giving. just want to make a couple of quick announcements. On your way out this morning, you'll see a tote that says coats for kids. If you, I'm pretty sure you didn't bring a coat for a kid today, but just a reminder, if you want to bring one for next week, Coats for kids, and if during the week you want to get one to us as well, that will be available up here at the church. Next week we will partake in the Lord's Supper, so prepare your hearts this week and come ready for communion next Sunday. And then also the Are You Ready Ministries annual benefit auction is two weeks away, just under two weeks, two weeks from yesterday. So we appreciate all the support for that already, and we know things are different and crazy this year, but we're going ahead with it. God willing, we've had a lot of support. We appreciate your prayers as well for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. The sheer grace, as our answer said today, that you have shown us through your Son and in so many other ways that we take for granted. Lord, forgive us for not being thankful, for being complainers. Lord, forgive me for that. Help us to be more thankful for one another, for all that you've done for us and what you will continue to do by your grace. And may this gospel that we just spoke of, that we're singing of, may it go out into this community through your people, Lord, and across this land. We pray for the missionaries that we support, that you would supply their needs. We thank you that we can be a part of that in helping supply their needs, Lord, financially. Help us to remember to pray for them more. Lord, strengthen them. And we thank you for this church, that we can gather in this place. And we ask this in Christ's name.
We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us. Crucified, dead, and buried. He rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us, he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king, building his church, interceding for us reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these truths. Help them to sink deep into us as we hear your word today. Lord, renew our minds, renew our affections, that we would be built up in the faith, that we would be encouraged. Lord, we would be warned. We would be rebuked and trained in your righteousness. We ask this by the Spirit's power and in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask uh, Ryan to grab these uh, voter guides.
to help you. Uh, many of you, for good reason, don't follow politics because it's you know it's such a battle in our country right now. But it's come time for us to do our civic duty, and Christians should be the best citizens in the United States. We should all be doing our duty and vote. And you need to take some time, it's one page, and it'll help you understand uh, how to cast your vote and what the issues are. Um, we want to represent Jesus Christ as best we can. Difficult. In the two-party system that we have, we have one party that lies to us and says that they love family and that they want to eliminate abortion and they want to do all that sort of thing. They say they do, at least they say they do. We, we can't do anything about what they do once they get to Washington. But at least they say they're going to. And it's been unfortunate uh, that some with great power in one party who says they're going to eliminate abortion, when they get the opportunity to do it, they don't do it. And it's really frustrating to many of you, I understand. And then you have another party, okay, that uh, just recently uh, has um, said that, you know, at age seven, as young as age seven, a presidential candidate that we might elect in this nation says at age seven, well, I don't even want to say it in the hearing of our children, okay? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to know what I'm talking about, okay? This is not, it's, it's child abuse is what it is, absolute child abuse. So please pay attention. Uh, elections have consequences in this nation. And because the church has been sleeping at the wheel, uh, man, I don't know. Get the day off. Uh, this is more important than a day's wage. It's more, if you lose money because you made plans to be at that polling booth to get your uh, vote in there, do it. It's critical, my friends. And, and I've given you some information here. Uh, you've got brains of your own, and I know you love Jesus, and you're going to want to represent him well. Um, please continue to keep Ray uh, Hines in your prayers. Uh, we love him, and we're so thankful he made it through the operation last week. He's doing fairly well. We, we need to continue to pray that his memory returns better. Uh, he still has some, some problems there, but they were able to remove that brain tumor, and we're praising God for it. Okay, so keep him in your prayers. We want to continue to keep Janet Boomhofer in our prayers. Uh, uh, how are you breathing this morning, dear one? Is it, is it okay? You're just saying that because I'm pointing you out in front of everybody. Okay, I'll stop. Uh, continue to pray. Jeanette uh, Beadle, last week on the way home. Could you believe it? Oh. Is she here? Did she make it this morning? Oh, oh Jeanette, we love you. Hi. She uh, she ended up uh, with her car flipped over, and they had to cut her out with the jaws of life last week, right after church. So breaks my heart that I didn't find out about it till about six o'clock. And if you guys gotta call me when you find these things out, I'm not a, not that I want to know the gossip. I want to be there for my congregation. I just felt terrible. Continue to keep my mom in prayer. She had an episode earlier this week that. Took her to uh, emergency. She fell, and we were concerned she broke her hip. Praise God, no broken bones, just a lot of stretching. She was in a very weird position when she fell. Um, you want to lift up Mike and Teresa Winborn too. You know they're very uh, susceptible. They can't afford to uh, to get COVID nineteen. We love them very much, and you'll notice we have a light crowd today. One of the reasons is because uh, we have a bunch of people supporting our dear former youth pastor, Dan Dickinson, and you know, we 
encouraged him on into seminary, and he's uh, he's just a good brother. We love him so much in this church. He really served us well when he was here, and he's starting at Shabona, which used to be a United Methodist Church. He pulled out of the Methodist Church, and, and uh, Dan Dickinson is their first pastor, and we want to support him, so keep him in your prayers. All right, enough of that. Keep these folks in your prayers, would you? We love them. We love our church. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11 in your Bibles as we continue our study of these corrective letters from Paul the Apostle to the Corinthian church. Paul has to deal with these false apostles who've led the Corinthians astray, who have slandered his apostleship. They've been cutting him down behind his back. We left off at uh, chapter 10, verse 18. You know, if these things are true, they should speak to Paul in the presence of other believers uh, publicly, or at least to his face privately. But they're slandering him. Uh, we left off at verse 18. What, is, what does it say there? For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Are you with me there? Chapter 10. Verse 18, it's not the one who commends himself who's approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. These false apostles were commending themselves. How do you react to that? The, the Corinthians didn't know how to handle it. You try to be loving, you know, you try to be Christ-like with patience, and you're hoping that they'll get it and stop being so pushy. You know, you, isn't that kind of the initial reaction? It's like, mm, cringe. Why are you acting that way? You know, stop. You know, and you offer patience and you hope they, they eventually, but Paul says, no, no, that's not how you handle it. That is not, listen, church, that's not how you handle it. I mean, yes, we count to 10 with one another. We want to be patient. But when it comes to deception and lies and gossip and slander, that's not how you handle it. Paul, Paul says they're liars. Accept it. Realize it. We don't like to say that. We don't want to accuse, you know. When you catch someone lying or slandering or gossiping, you've got to you got to deal with that. Paul's saying to oppose my gospel is to oppose Christ. And your first clue should have been that when someone commends themselves, you got a problem. He's drawing attention to them himself and not Jesus Christ. Paul didn't do that. Paul didn't draw attention to himself. He could have. He did many miracles. He always gave the glory to Jesus Christ. It was always, hey, look to Jesus. Look what Christ has done. And that should be our first clue. They should have thought, why? Why are you opposing Paul? Who are you? They should have thought, Paul risked his life for our souls to preach the God. I became a Christian. And believed because of Paul's preaching. Why, why are you doing this? All you guys have sacrificed is a little bit of time so that and energy and maybe a little volunteering so that people would praise you. Since these false apostles are bragging, Paul brags with biting sarcasm today to undermine their credibility. Remember, they were waving their letters of recommendation around. Look at me, look at me, look at me. They got letters of recommendation from Jerusalem. And they audaciously usurp Paul's duties. So Paul begs the church in verse 1 to bear with his foolishness. And he's going to be, he said, I'm, I'm doing this, this is hyperbole. I'm being obnoxious for your benefit. To, foolishness to reveal the truth. That's the title of our message 
today. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. Starting with 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1. I wish you'd bear with me in a little foolishness. To bear with me, do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I'm not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order, listen, to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of Christ. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is the word of God. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you reveal your truth to us. In the midst of all the lies that surround us in this wicked and adulterous generation, we know from your word that the truth will set us free. Help us to not be naive of how Satan works and how Satan deceives us with nice, eloquent people, useful idiots that he uses to deceive people. Give our church discernment in this wicked and adulterous generation. Give our church, the river's edge, the will to oppose the devil and all of his evil and those who serve him, who tell lies. Protect us from Satan's deceit by the power of your Holy Spirit. For the name and glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You might be seated. All right. Let's go back to verse 1 now. Let's tear into this. We have 15 verses. And it's not going to be too long. But we study God's word. Everybody say it. I love God's word. I'm ready to study. All right. You get into that Bible. Open that Bible right there to verse 1. All right. Thank you, Ryan. I told him not to put the scripture up there so that you actually use your Bibles. And I don't care if you use your phone. That's fine. That's great. So I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do, you, do bear with me. Okay, so we got to get that straight uh, so that we interpret this correctly. And he's being sarcastic. 
He's, he's going to act foolish. And uh, sometimes I feel bad. It is often the way I preach and people get mad at me and complain sometimes because I'm sarcastic. And it often hurts their feelings. And they blame the hurt feelings on the sarcasm. And actually, it's the sarcasm that pierces deep into the soul and convicts us that we should repent of our sins. It reveals the truth. Foolishness reveals the truth to us this morning. And so he, he steps out of character and he becomes like the false apostles. Me monsters, you know, look at me, look at me, look at me. To reveal how foolish they've been, these Corinthians. To not be able to discern false apostles who so divided them and confused them. It happens in churches all the time. I'm capable of being deceived. We need to admit this. Verse 2, for I feel a divine jealousy for you. This is the reason he gives for acting so foolish. He has a, a divine jealousy. There's going to be no shared affection here. I'm jealous that you love these false teachers. These are false apostles. And I feel that way. I feel that way toward you when I hear you. Hey, have you read this book? And I'm going, ding, ding, ding. red flag, red flag, red flag. What are you reading that book for? That's a terrible book. And then when I mention the name of the author, then you really get offended. And I feel the same jealousy. Not because I think I'm the best preacher in the world. It's because I know it's false teaching. Your best life now, for instance. Totally opposing the, the Bible. The truth of God's word. I'll give you another example to make you mad today too. Okay? I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband. Not two. One. No two time in Jesus. One husband. To present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Now, how can we be pure virgins to Christ? We've lost our virginity. They've lost their virginity from their sins. Past, present, and future sins. They're, they're sinners. They've already lost it. How do you... How do you get, we are washed pure, made holy in Jesus Christ. Remember, we're united to Christ. We're, if we're united to Christ, we're united to eternity. Who was and is and evermore shall be. We can't hardly understand eternity, can we? But we're united to Jesus Christ eternally in our union with Christ. And how are we united to him? By faith. Faith in his death and resurrection. Our sin is crucified and we're robed in righteousness through his resurrection all the way 2,000 years ago. We're forgiven and justified through our belief in the cross 2,000 years ago. Made just as if we'd never sinned. Virgins pure, spotless bride for Christ. Paul's jealous. Stop it. Stop cheating on Jesus. Don't, don't listen to these false teachers. They're the bride of Christ Jesus Almighty. And these false apostles, they're not going to win. They will not prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And Satan is their father, and he's bound for hell. Paul's like a father. He knew them before Christ. He introduced them to Jesus Christ. And he has a deep interest in their faithfulness. He uses marriage. Turn with me to Ephesians 5. Hold your place there. He uses marriage as a metaphor today in this second verse. But he's also said it even more Clearly in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. And we can just pick up where, where it says, don't get 
He reminds you at the end of this chapter, by the way, in Ephesians, that he's speaking of the church. All right? But he's also telling husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Well, let's, let's look at this. Let's start with this because this is what he's saying. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That's the preaching of God's word, folks. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Isn't that beautiful? This is what Christ has done. He gave himself up for her. Say it. He gave himself up for her. Do you have this kind of commitment to her? I want to be like Jesus. I hear people say, I want to be like Jesus. And they go to church once every six weeks. Boy, that's commitment. That's give it, That's devotion. The Bible says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. How do you even know your brother if you never attend church and never get close to your brothers and sisters in Christ and find out what they need and what's going on? That's the body of Christ. Verse 3, but I'm afraid. He's concerned. There are many deceptions out there. There are so many lies out there right now. Many, so many lies. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and partial devotion to Christ. Are you following along in the scriptures? Are you reading the text? Are you catching me deceive you? Because it didn't say partial devotion, did it? What did it say? A pure devotion. Man, when there is something wrong with the gospel that's being preached, we need to call it out. You need to keep me accountable. Don't trust me like that. Trust the scriptures like that. And when I'm not preaching it right, or when Ryan doesn't preach it right, or Vogie doesn't preach it right, or Stefan doesn't preach it right, well, then we gotta we got to speak up. Brother, that's not what the, the verse said. Pure devotion. The under shepherd Paul spots the the wolf here. Satan using false apostles to seduce the bride of Christ. He calls it for what it is. Paul is God's pastor, his shepherd. What does a shepherd do? A shepherd takes care of the wolf. And Paul is going to unload with both barrels. This has been brewing since the first letter, first verse, first chapter of these two Corinthians letters. This has been brewing. This is not a knee-jerk reaction. No. And why is he doing this? Why is he blowing them out of the water, calling them for what they are? Why? Because he loves the bride of Christ with a divine jealousy. Don't mess. Think about it. Think about it. Guys, are you going to mess with somebody else's bride? Seriously? Unless you want to get a bloody nose? You know, you might be stronger than that guy, but he's going to hurt you. <laughs> Don't mess with my bride. And you better not mess with the bride of Jesus Christ. He's almighty. You think he's not going to have a divine jealousy? And you're not going to pay the price for messing with her? Oh, my friends. He unloads with both barrels for good reason. He has a divine jealousy. Look at verse 4. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted. What did he say of that in Galatians? Uh, chapter 1, verse 8, he says, let them be a curse. Let them be damned if they preach another gospel. Paul said, you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted. You put up with a readily, though, enough. 
You put it up, you put up with it readily enough. They're deceived. They're, they're tolerating another gospel. Toleration. You know. So in light of verse 1, Paul's saying, bear with me with my foolishness since they tolerate Satan who's been comparing themselves to each other instead of uh, he has them comparing themselves to each other instead of Christ who is the holy standard of all things. Instead of comparing themselves to others, comparing the apostles, comparing the different teachers, you know. Paul, Peter, Apollos. Verse chapter 1. Now what does it do when they start comparing to one another? And isn't that the deception that, that Satan does in the church? Well, he's doing that. Look at him. Oh, he's wonderful. He can play the guitar. Wow. Oh, look at him. They're more holy than me. Oh, that's so dumb. It's just wrong. Don't allow yourself to do that. But what, what do you have going on when there's comparison going on? You have winners and losers. Losers. The winners are prideful, cocking their chest out and acting like peacocks. And the losers are are hopeless. And oh, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not skinny enough. I'm not a good mom. I covet what they have. I'm terrible. That's stupid. That's not what Jesus does with his people. That is not the Christian attitude. No. Christ washes his bride in the word to make her a humble people. Grateful people. Faithful people. A faithful bride. That's what he does. And since they like to start quarrels, these false apostles... By who's better than the other, Paul, Peter, Apollos, remember verse 12 of chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians? Well, that's where we started off. I mean, right then and there, when we started these, this study of these two letters, right there in the first chapter of the first letter, these false apostles are living rent-free in Paul's mind, and he's going after them. And right here, in our text, this is where it is. He's calling them exactly what they are. And so he says, since you like to divide people, let's go ahead and play that game. I'll act foolish to show you how stupid it is. To show you how wrong it is. And then you might ask, well, how were they supposed to know the false apostles or satanic angels of light? How were they supposed to know? Verses 13 and 14. Paul is going to brag and compare himself to them using the same foolishness to reveal the truth to them. He leads them to Christ. And he's going to point out how they lead them to themselves. See? Verse 5. And indeed, I consider that I'm not in the least inferior to these super apostles. They claim... To be super, superior, superior, same word, etymology. They're deceivers. And good deceivers, satanic deceivers, can brag with eloquence. You hardly notice. That's why we don't want to tolerate any false teaching. That's why we want to be pure in gospel preaching here in this church. Well, they just got a little bit of it wrong. No, we don't want pray. We get it pure and right according to Scripture. If we preach like cavemen and we're not very eloquent here at the river's edge, yet we remain faithful to the Word of God, follow the Word of God, and not the fancy preacher. Follow God's Word, not a pushy, popular preacher who deceives. You know, I had a meeting with Rob Bell, 1999, when we started this church, the same month he started his church. He grew by leaps and bounds. He started with a thousand people. 
He started with a thousand people in his church in Grand Rapids. The church he went to helped him. They sent a bunch of people to, to go with him. Uh, my meeting, uh, I couldn't get there. I was busy. So we didn't meet. He went on to be a great, successful pastor. He went on the Oprah Winfrey show. He wrote a book called Love Wins. He taught, listen, I'm using his name, Rob Bell. Do not follow him. He taught in his book, Love Wins, that everybody goes to heaven. Everybody gets saved because love wins. God is love and everybody, it doesn't matter what you do, live it up. Eat, drink, and be merry. Sure, tomorrow we die, but love wins. And I call him out this morning. It's heresy. It's godless. It's not the pure gospel. Amen? Amen. Are you mad at me? No. Well, John, you don't have... I'm, I'm not jealous of him. I'm jealous for your affection for Jesus Christ. A divine jealousy. Amen? Amen. Understand that when I bring these things up, I, I, it's not sour grapes up here. It's a concern for your soul. That's my job. Verse 6, If I'm even if I'm unskilled in speaking and I'll readily avail uh, myself to you, I know that I'm sometimes hard to listen to, I'm, I'm sure. You know, when we get toward the end of this message, I'll, I'll see you. Uh, I need sugar. I need something. You know, I see you. Even if I'm unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge, and neither am I, because I have the Word of God at my disposal. I'm not so, it's all sufficient, my friends. The, the, the scriptures are all sufficient. Everything we need for life and godliness. I'm confident of that. I'm not so in knowledge, indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Paul's enemies slandered him. They said he was no apostle. They said his debating skill doesn't come close to the great philosophers of Corinth, of Greece, Plato, and Aristotle, and the like. Go with me to 1 Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians. Hold your place. And then go to verse 17. You're listening. You're doing good. How you doing? You enjoying church? Right on. Right on. Hey, if you get a chance, what's your name? Nikita. Mm -hmm. Nikita? Is that right? Did I get it right? If you get a chance to meet Nikita, slap her five. This is her first time in church. Let's give her a big hand. It's great to have you. Come back. I'm thinking about you because I don't want to lose you. I want to. I want to. Um, want to keep your attention, and I hope you're hearing what I'm saying here this morning. Okay. And so here in in this uh, first Corinthian letter, verse 17, we see that for two letters he's been saying he doesn't persuade people with human wisdom. That's not how you reach God. He preaches the gospel of Christ, demonstrating the Spirit's power to make new believers. The Spirit's power to save the gospel. Look at verse 70. For Christ did not send me. He was sent on a mission by Jesus Christ himself on the road to Damascus. He didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross... Lest the cross be emptied of its power. You understand that, right? If he's eloquent, people are going to get saved because of his eloquence and not because of the cross. No, 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 no. I dare not compete with the cross. I can't do that as a pastor, as a preacher. Neither can he. Doesn't matter about your debating skills. Doesn't matter about how eloquent you are in your preaching. Verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly, foolishness 
to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of, this, of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? They were the great scholars, those scribes. Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world didn't know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The cross, Christ crucified for your salvation. That's the truth. And it seems crazy to people. They don't, they don't know how this could possibly work. Well, that's not, that's not uh, intellectual. That's stupid. That's the, the, what are you talking about? Go to chapter 2 in the first Corinthian letter. Skip another page, maybe, I don't know where it is in your Bible. Go to verse 4 of chapter 2. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirits and of power. Now go back to chapter 11 of of 2 Corinthians. The Corinthians saw this demonstration. And that's how they believed, because Paul preached the gospel. But then they were easily deceived. Are you? Are you easily deceived? No, John, I'm not. I'm pretty savvy. I can spot it. I'm pretty skeptical. You should see me. I'm pretty smart. I got this down. Really? Eve was deceived. Well, yeah, I know Eve was deceived. Eve was sinless when she was deceived. Are you? Are you a sinner? Have you been sinning ever since day one, self-centered sinner? We're sinners. Well, let's look at Israel. Israel, they were deceived, and they, they, they saw the, the great plagues that God poured out on Pharaoh. They were freed miraculously from slavery. They saw the angel of death come and kill all these firstborn babies. They saw the Red Sea part, and, and they went through it on dry land to the other side. They saw the the armies of Pharaoh swallowed up by the sea. And in three days, they were murmuring and complaining and wanting to go back to Egypt. How do you do that? You see great things. God has saved your soul. Yet you're deceived by the world as well. Say it. I am capable of being deceived. Say it. I am capable of being deceived. Be careful. When you think you stand, the Bible says, you'll fall. You'll fall. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Amen? Now go to verse 7 of our text. Or did I commit it? Now this is, this takes some understanding here. Did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? Is this saying that all preachers should preach free of charge? No, that's not what he's saying. The false apostles are saying, you, you mean you guys aren't paying him an apostle's wage? He's not getting paid an apostle's wage? The Corinthians didn't know. They're baby Christians. They're ignorant of Jewish ways and the fact that you're supposed to be supporting the preacher. They were ignorant of it. And the false apostles claim that, that Paul not receiving a wage from you is basically an admission. He knows he shouldn't be paid like the real apostles over there in Jerusalem and up in Antioch. You know, the original 12. He knows. That's an admission. And he's saying, is it a sin to humble myself 
so that these Corinthians can hear the gospel? I eliminated the problem. They didn't understand about collections and stuff. They were moving slowly here. We don't want them to dis... Oh, he's just trying to... He did all this for money. That's why he... Oh, he saved our souls so that we would give him money. You understand? Trust me, I had to do a little of that when we planted this church. We had to be very, very careful about that stuff. And many people from all over the country, from Are You Ready Ministries, supported me so that I could pay the bills. Hey, I have to eat too. I'm like anybody else, you know. Verse 8, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. Paul was entitled to that money. Money that the Corinthians might have given to him if they'd have used their heads. Verse 9, and when I was with you and was in need, I didn't burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. And they were poor. You know, I made tents. I was with you for two years. I made tents. Some of you worked with me. And when I ran out of money, Macedonia took care of me. So, look, at, look, it goes on. So I refrained, and I will refrain from burdening you in any way. He wants to, he wants to correct them in all these areas, and there were so many, you can go through it again, you know, the way they were taking communion, the gender confusion that they were, it's just a mess, you know, and the incest and everything, he had to correct these things. And it's, it's interesting, he accepted support, we know from the New Testament, Testament from Philippi, which is in Macedonia, but he didn't from Thessalonica, which was in Macedonia. He wouldn't accept it from them, and he wouldn't accept it from Corinth. Paul said the Lord commanded that the, listen, in 1 Corinthians 9, 14, you don't have to go there. I'll just read you the passage. The Lord commanded, everybody say it, the Lord commanded, did you hear that? that that's a command, okay? This is not an option. And you're going to say, oh, that's kind of uh, that's kind of convenient for you, isn't it, John? But I'm just going to say it. This is the scripture. It's not me. The Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So Paul had a right to receive a wage from these Corinthians. According to scripture, it was commanded. How much of the scripture can you take? Can I just bring a fire hose and just blow your heads off with it every Sunday? Got to give it to you a little bit at a time. Here. He commands the support of his preachers. Corinth was stubborn. They needed corrective and hard preaching. If Paul depended on them, he'd starve. Receiving their money would have bred distrust. What they owed him would go for the poor of Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem. And we read about that and studied that collection that he took. And it would also go to support the original apostle. Pa Paul was actually raising money for the apostles that the false apostles were accusing him. Oh, he doesn't receive an apostle's wage. Well, he's not an apostle. That's because he knows he's not an apostle. We're apostles. We have this direct line to Christ, they claim. Some follow Apollos, some follow Cephas and Peter, some follow Paul. We follow Christ. <laughs> I don't know what you guys are doing. We got a direct line to Jesus. Heretics always burden people too, by the way. I did not burden anyone, Paul says. Today, the burden placed on you by many in the church who know better, they preach a social gospel because it sounds good. You want to get a bunch of liberals coming to church again? Preach a social gospel. 
you know, social, social, social programs constantly. They say, put your Bible down and hear the culture and pay your reparations for the damages you caused by your white privilege. You've already heard it, haven't you? But it sets you back. You don't want to be accused of being a racist, right? And trust them with that money too, the reparations that you pay them for this perceived sin that you com committed 175 years ago, your ancestors. Own it, it's yours. I'm gonna burden you with the weight of your guilt right now. No. What's the gospel say? Let me remind you what the gospel says. My job, okay? There's now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Isn't that awesome? You remember that when people burden you with weight and guilt of stuff you didn't even do. We're justified by faith in Christ crucified and resurrected. Sinners forgiven and robed in righteousness. And for those of us that are united in Christ, those who belong to his church, membership does have its privileges. We never apologize for the privilege and blessing of being a child of God, my friends. Yes, we have Christian gospel privilege. And there's nothing to apologize for. Are you going to give away your inheritance in Jesus Christ because somebody called you a name and said you were racist? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not condoning any racism. No color. Hey, we hired the first black pastor in this county. So get off my back, all right? I have no racism in my blood. I love, you know, we all have the same color blood. I, I'm not a racist. Don't, don't, go peddle that to somebody else. Michael Ture is one of my best friends, and he's blacker than black can be. He's so black, he's exotically black. I mean, he's beautiful black. He shines. His skin shines with blackness. I love it. And I mistakenly brushed my teeth with his toothbrush once. So leave me alone. It just irritates me that somebody lies like that. The false apostles burden these Corinthians too. Well, what do they burden them with? Circumcision. You mean you're not circumcised? You gotta get circumcised. You mean you're not going to the feasts? You guys need to celebrate the feasts. You guys aren't doing the food laws? Hey, you gotta be careful about what you guys are eating. And they want them to doubt Paul as well. Doubt Paul, respect us. We're real apostles. By comparison, Paul's no burden to the Corinthians. He, he, he gets beaten up trying to, trying to get the gospel to those guys physically. He preaches there's now no condemnation in Christ, and he does it free of charge. Verse 10. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine. He's saying, listen, you guys brought this on. You're trusting these foolish, false apostles. So I'll just act like them, I guess. And maybe you'll get it. This boasting of mine, now, in this particular verse, <laughs> he's boasting about the gospel. I will boast in Jesus Christ, okay? So we've got to be careful the use of the word here. He says, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. He won't let them stop the spread of the gospel to the rest. Corinth, uh, geographically, was the gateway to Achaia, the large peninsula that just sort of bulges out, almost like an island, like a bubble, out into the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And why? Why will I not stop boasting of Christ? This truth of Christ that is in him? The fact that he's inspired 
by the word of God to speak the very words of God? The Bible? Why? Why am I not going to let you stop me? Because I do not love you? You know I do. God knows I do. And he proves his love by preaching the gospel. He's not going to shy away from it. He knows that the truth trumps eloquency, flattery, debating skills, philosophy. It's the gospel that has the power to save, not that. He's an apostle sent by Christ, and the truth hurts. Truth always hurts. Truth stings a little this morning. Hurting Paul more than Corinth. He preached the truth and he was brutalized for it. Jesus preached the truth and he was crucified. It's just the way it is. Preacher takes it more than the person who's hurt by the truth. But they're hurt by the truth hurts. It just does. And you know, we have a president right now, I'll just say, side note. I mean, he's like Fred Flintstone. The guy is not a great speaker. He sticks his foot in his mouth. But you know what? So far, he's told more truth than any politician I ever know. And I didn't like him at first at all. And we better pray for that man. Sorry for some of you who just can't hardly, you know, hey, hold your nose and mark the mark. Pray for him. It, you know, we can't have more abortion and pedophilia. We, we can do without that. Side note, back to our message. So Paul here is an apostle. And he's, he's going to pay a temporary price for telling the truth. But he will be glorified in heaven. He'll have a special place in heaven. Probably one of the, you know, there's 24 thrones in the Bible. Apostles and prophets, Revelation speaks of. I kind of think he'll be there. I'm not sure. Confused because there were, you know, Matthias was chosen by a straw. You know, uh, he was a kind of a strange disciple after Judas died. So I'm not sure if Apostle gets that throne or uh, 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 Apostle Matthias gets that throne or Paul. Look at verse 12. And what am I? What I am doing? I'll continue to do in order to un look at what he's doing. He's undermining the claim. He's going right after him undermining their claim of, of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they're bragging about their mission they work on the same terms as we do they don't speak the word of God none of these false apostles have a book in the Bible not a single one their claim of apostleship is a lie they live the good life though while Paul is beaten thrown in jail, whipped, starved, stoned, and left for dead. We're going to see it in this chapter. It's not a knee-jerk reaction that he has. He's been patient with them for over a year. They masked themselves in the light of half-truths. It's just like Satan. Satan twists truth. He uses truth. It sounds good. He did it with Eve. He did it with Jesus Christ in the desert. He did it to the Corinthians. And he'll do it to you. Verse 13. For such men are false apostles. Right there he calls them out. They're liars. False. Deceitful workmen. I think deceit is worse than lies. It's half-truths. It's cunning. It's crafty, it's creepy, it's like a snake sneaking around the corner. Evil. Sinister. These, these false apostles disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. It goes on today. It goes on today, my friend. Look at me. God told me. God told me blah, 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 blah. God told me blah, 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 blah. God told me blah, blah, blah. Uh, run. Run. Somebody using God as an excuse? You don't need to say that. You don't ever need to say, God told me. God told me. 
And I know there's a still small voice and God speaks to us and he always reminds us of scripture. It is written. How about go there? The Bible says, not God told me, I got a special line to Christ. I got a special line to God. Don't even argue. Don't even think about arguing with me because God told me. There's how you spot a deceiver. Don't be blaming stuff on God. Don't be giving him credit for your stupidity. Be careful when you say God told me. All right? That might sting right now. That's such a popular thing to do in Christian circles. God told me. God told me. Be careful. Be careful. We've said it before. We have three instances in the Bible where God spoke and people begged him to stop. They were afraid. They were fearful in every instance when he spoke. You seem pretty cavalier about it. God told me, God told me, God told me. Yeah, God told me. Me and Jesus. I call him Jeezy. We're, we're, we're tight. I call him Jeezy. You're from California, aren't you? Oh, no. All right. so, anyway, these... These guys weren't commissioned by Christ. They weren't endowed with gifts. They weren't endowed with signs and wonders. Uh, neither did they speak the inspired word of God. Real apostles have no need to deceive. So Paul exposes them. He tells the truth about them. Real apostles don't wear masks, claiming special access, remember? Remember? I follow Paul, I follow Peter, I follow Apollos, but we follow Christ. Verse 12, first chapter, the first letter. In fact, Paul boasts of his weakness. He's not going around sticking his chest out. He, he brags about his weakness. He brags about his thorn in the flesh here in a few verses. He brags about being the chief of sinners. In the book of Philippians, he speaks of, not that I've already achieved this, speaking of perfection. He knows he's a sinner. Verse 14, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Now he unmasks them. Now he calls them what they are. Satanic. They're liars. Who's the father of lies? Be cautious of the me monsters, the eloquent smart guys in the room, the angels of light, the talking heads on Fox News and CNN. Be careful. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Satan was one of the highest created beings in heaven. He's cunning, he's fallen, and he's a formidable father of lies. Paul exposes their satanic lies. May God give us eyes to see the truth, ears to hear the truth, minds to remember the truth, hearts to believe the truth, and a will to obey the truth so we can see lies cloaked in half-truths. We need to study the truth. We need to know the truth because the truth will set us free. Satan knows the truth. Satan knows the truth of who Jesus is. And he hates the fact that Jesus is Lord and creator of the universe. Jesus knows, or Satan knows that. Do you have satanic belief? Demon faith? Because Satan believes. But he'll do anything to deceive the elect. He hates it. He hates the truth. Verse 15. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So, listen. If nice is the rule, and some of, some of you might be say, you know, John, you could say that a little nicer. You could be nicer. Because nice is the rule in our culture. Um, if nice is the rule for you, 
you are already deceived. You're already deceived. Yeah, but we have to show the love of Christ. And we have to be nice. How nice is this? What Paul's saying, he's just called them satanic liars. How nice is that? You brood of vipers, John the Baptist said. Look at what Jesus called the Pharisees. We're fighting Satan. Ah, nice to him. Especially when he deceives those I dearly love. I'm going to be nice. Satan masquerade. He, this is his mask. Niceness in our culture. We live in a day where truth is considered to be mean-spirited. We're all required to believe ridic ridiculous lies. Like a seven-year-old deciding his gender, according to Joe Biden. Or toxic masculinity. We can't be masculine. Let's get rid of all these John Waynes. We're tired of them. These Ronald Reagans. These people that act like men. We're expected to be nice feminists, where women can be men and men can be girls, destroying families, aborting babies, and pushing gender confusion. Feminism is a lie. It rejects God's created order. In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says, He created them male and female. He created them and He blessed them. That's the way they were created. And when you change that or try to change that, you're shaking your fist at God and you say, I don't like what you made. I don't like what you made me. I covet something else. I want something else. You're not good enough, God. Feminism says, no, it's not fair what God has created. In fact, the Bible is systemic misogyny. Less pay, because life is all about more pay, living the good life and, and coveting and acquiring stuff, apparently. Life is all about living the good life, you know? Eating out, farming out the kids, cook, farming out the cooking, farming out the housework. That's, that's, our, that's our culture. And the rejection of stupid, authoritarian males who can't even change diapers or start the grill without catching it on fire. That's what you see in the commercials on TV. When's the last time you saw a smart male on TV? No, what we need is truth. And so Paul gives it to him. He uses foolishness. To reveal the truth. He uses these false apostles' own foolish method of comparison to shine the light of truth. He'll, he'll continue to brag throughout this chapter. We'll get into it next week. But we live in a world that hates truth. We need to stop riding the fence trying to appease this world. They're wrong. It's satanic. They're lies. Paul said... Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? Dear brethren, beloved brothers and sisters of Christ, I beg you, stay away from professing Christians who are ashamed of the Bible and this truth in this wicked and adulterous generation. Stop fellowship, fellowshipping with those who call themselves Christians yet believe all these worldly philosophies. The Bible's clear. James said, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The world sadly thinks the truth of God's word, the gospel, is foolish. Paul begs them to bear with his foolishness while he undermines those false apostles and their lies. 
to expose them for the fools they truly are. By God's grace, we do the same in this church, preaching the unmitigated truth of God's word, like fools, every Sunday, every week, to demolish the lies of the devil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, let it be so. God, let these lies be buried. God, protect our people. Lord, your dear lambs. Lord, don't let the wolves devour them. Don't let Satan come and devour them. Lord, let them embrace your holy word. Embrace one another in the holy faith. In the communion of the saints. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand? We don't glorify ourselves, we glorify Christ who saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves souls. You're old enough to know that Jesus saves. And Jesus loves you. He wants to save your soul. That's the truth of the gospel. He will forgive your sins and make you just as if you'd never sinned. That's the gospel. He doesn't pound more guilt on you. We don't believe what is false. Amen? We believe the truth. Amen. So let's sing glory be to the Father. We give him glory for the salvation we enjoy and the freedom we enjoy. Mm. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning it is now I love you. May his face shine on you. May his blessings shine on you today and all through the week. We'll see you next week.